We're live. I'm going to um, get to it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Working Towards Black. Working Towards Black is a series of conversations really to help us bridge the gap between the diaspora and the continent and even all of the inner workings within the diaspora. And um, we are looking through these conversations to really begin to grow um, understanding amongst each other, um, to be able to bridge some of the gaps that exist between us and to dispel myths and rumors and misconceptions between us and to build relationship. Um, that is the purpose. And so uh, today we have Sosina Tafari. Did I pronounce your name correctly? You did. Okay. <laughs> All my friends of the content are always making fun of me at the beginning of the show of how I, how I pronounce people's names. So I'm always practicing before now <laughs> we get yeah. started. Um, and I just want to read your bio real quick, if you don't mind. So, uh, so Sina has been in the entrepreneurial space for over two years, uh, working with organizations to define their message and achieve their set goals. Using her past experience in senior, senior leadership, Position. So Sina has been instrumental in designing and delivering on company strategies, first by dif differentiating the company and its goal from others, and then applying laser focused processes in order to deliver the desired result. And today we're going to get into some of the work that she's doing here and for the government and on the continent. And thank you so much, Sina, for joining us today. Sure. It's a pleasure. <laughs> So I always kind of start out with, you know, where this starts. I like to know where you're from, what it was like growing up as a young child in your country. Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, you know, it's uh, I, 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 I have to say COVID has taught us how to become an online community. So, so uh, we're slowly uh, warming up to the idea of having these conversations online. So thanks. A um, little bit about my background. I am uh, originally from Ethiopia by way of Cleveland. I was actually born in Cleveland, and then oh. I, yeah, and I, uh, 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 my parents um, and I moved back to Ethiopia because my father and mother were very critical about um, raising myself and my brother in Ethiopia. And uh, you know, I I attended uh, 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 school. Uh, through 12th grade and then you know promptly at at uh, at the university juncture we were shipped back to the US for uh, for further education um, I did my undergrad degree at uh, Penn State uh, University at Penn State College um, I don't know that uh, I knew what I was doing I was very young when I came back to the US so you know I, I chose my my major on a it sounds good kind of uh, uh, deductive reasoning, not really, uh, you know, focused on on where I wanted to end up. By chance, I I got a job. Um, I was pursuing my master's degree in in, in the Baltimore area, and I uh, by chance I landed um, uh, on a job with a company called MCI, which today um, people will recognize as Verizon, mm. and um, I. Um, spent uh, 27 glorious day, uh, years in, in the telecom industry uh, where I learned boot camp, uh, the boot camp uh, process at, uh, at MCI. But I was fortunate enough to have uh, joined uh, many types of organizations, small, large, you know, multinational um, uh, niche uh, markets. And uh, I would say that the last 10 years of my career um, I spent working uh, on the continent of Africa and the Middle East. Um, I have traveled to over 60 countries globally um, wearing the telecom hat. And uh, at the end of 2018, I decided that um, uh, it was time to move on. And uh, so I re-enrolled in school. That's my safe haven. Um, I think I have six or seven degrees now, but uh, to pursue <laughs> <Wow>. one more. <laughs> And uh, this time in artificial intelligence and machine learning and social uh, media science. And there's a whole science behind it. Um, so uh, for the last two years, I've focused on uh, trying to uh, manage companies. So hopefully that gives you a little flavor about who I am and uh, how, I, how I got here. <laughs> so. <laughs> so when your 
parents decided that you guys need to go back so that you can be schooled and you can live as a child and grow as a child in Ethiopia, what was their thinking? Were they communicating with you what that value meant to them? Why they thought that that was going to be important for you? We were too young. I mean, I I was two when I went back, so I don't know that I, that they I don't I don't know that they thought that there was an option. You know, I think they wanted to go back uh, because my dad was done with his studies. Um, mm. I, I don't know that, you know, the concept of me being born in the U.S. and having um, a birth certificate from the U.S., the, the concept that we're used to today did not exist back in the 70s, right? They, it was just a function. I happened to be born here. It, it never registered that it had uh, benefits or value. Um, for them, I was Ethiopian. I was going, the, we were all going to go back and that's where we we're going to live. But um, as an option, uh, I think my dad always thought that I could come back or we could come back to the US for education and that the US would look at us favorably and grant us visas to come back. To the point yeah. that when I left Ethiopia, when I was getting ready to leave Ethiopia, uh, my dad, uh, God rest his soul, put, took us through the whole process of getting an Ethiopian passport, only to be told at the U.S. Embassy that we cannot travel to our country, quote unquote, um, on, on a foreign passport that I had to travel on a U.S. passport. So um, I remember it was back in, you know, 1986, and we had to go through that uh, yeah, interesting process. So he didn't realize that you were an American because you were born here. I think he knew that, but I don't. I don't know that. Um, uh, I don't know that he did the math that I needed to travel with a with a U.S. passport. Um, there was no Google back then. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, so you 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 th you think logically. I mean, he was a physician in Ethiopia, so he was well traveled. He knew Absolutely. what mm -hmm. what he had to do, but. He didn't. He didn't do that math uh, that I needed uh, to travel on it. But here we are. You know, he, they thought being cultured was important, and it helped us become a, um, or helped me become a well-rounded person. Um, I understand both worlds, and here I am, lucky enough to consider working on both continents. And nice. Yeah. <laughs> what does it mean to you to be Ethiopian? Does that have a specific like sense of, of identity and pride? Is that something that's deeply important to you? Um, of course it is. I think, I think identity is, you know, let, let me take it a, a, a different, let me answer that question a different way. I have a child who's 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I grew up, when I came to the US and I uh, enrolled in college, I didn't fit anywhere. You know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't relate to the African American community here because I, I didn't understand that culture. And I'm being very honest about, about, about this. Yeah, um, I couldn't fit in with the Caucasian community because, you know, that was also different. And 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 so I I just I was just there. You know, I was just. I mean, if you ask me, do you keep in touch with any of your college friends? I might keep in touch with three or four, but other than that, considering the number of hours I spent on the campus, I don't, the people that are close to me are the people that I went to grade school with, with um, them, because that's the culture that binds us. That's, that's how I grew up. I grew up with that culture and that's what kept us together. That's, that's the glue that held us together and it continues to hold us today. So to answer your question, it's very important to know, you know, uh, I'm glad I know my roots. I'm glad I know my culture. I'm glad I understand it. And 100% I embrace it because it's who I am. So when you're growing up as a little girl in Ethiopia and you're going through the schooling system, you're you're not necessarily having, are you, are you having connection with America and Black American experience? I mean, the 70s and like that all of the aid, that's a, a, a prime time for like Black power movement. And is Ethiopia disconnected from that conversation at that point? I, I had no idea. I think the only 
reference I remember was, you know, Shaft in Africa or something like that. But I have no, um, I don't know that I even, um, I mean, the answer is no. I, I didn't have any clue. You know, we, we, how? You have to watch movies or you have to watch TV or you have to, uh, you know, be glued to a TV screen. We didn't have that then, you know. Uh, where When I grew up, we had three hours of TV, of which 90% of it was socialist propaganda. So I had no, no idea. Mm. So what is happening? So one of the things that I try to do with this, because I realize, like, you know, we take for granted that people kind of know what it's like to be a kid or to grow up in a particular set of values. And we don't really know, like, they're all so different, you know, what is growing up like in Ethiopia? What are you doing every day? What is schooling like? What, what's the, what are the core values of that particular community? So um, for me, for us, um, you know, my, uh, my parents raised us in a very protective environment because the, the political situation in the country was not good. Uh, you know, the years, my formative years when I was in Ethiopia, it was, it was, um, you know, I mean, was it safe? It was safe, but they, they, they protected us from a lot of the noise that was around us. I got up in the morning, I went to school, my mom came and picked us up from school, we came home, wash, rinse, repeat, you know, there was, <laughs> there was no creativity or anything like that there. And the summers will go to a to a lake where you know all the you know my 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 parents friends you know there's a close knit group of uh, families uh, we all you know sectioned off two weeks in the summer and we got shipped over to the to this lake and we spent our two weeks there and came back and that was about it i mean we'd see family from time to time it was a very slow and monotonous lifestyle but it was a safe lifestyle that we that we, we lived when i think of how we live today and how i raised my son we're like on steroids almost you know no time to breathe you know you're running from one chaos to another chaos um it's very different um but but back then you know it was a very relaxed slow existence and, and it worked. So when you transition to the US and you start, you you enroll in college and you feel disconnected, right? Like what are, what are some of the cultural things and cultural um, nuances that you're noticing that are so different from you? What, what, what is happening around you that you're noticing? So I'm, I'm, I'm talking about something that happened 30 years ago. So I'm going to date myself <laughs> here a bit. Um, you know, I think when I came, it was a, when I first landed and I went to school here, I think the, the first thing I would, I would say is that um, there's that awe, you know, you're like, oh, I'm in America. I'm, you, you, you read your Archie comics and your Jughead comics and you read Nancy Drew and you think everything is around, you know, it, it's, it's how it's described in these books that we read. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's, it's different. And I think every day, you know, our, our goal, my goal was just to survive the current day, you know, until to the next day. And then, you know, days became weeks, weeks became months, months became years. And, um, you know, it was more of a survival. Uh, survival? Uh, what what do, what were you surviving? Was it a sense of loneliness? Was it isolation? Was it? I don't know, just getting over, you know, I, I, I think you grow up with somebody doing everything for you, right? The only responsibility I had in Ethiopia was to study, that's it. I had no other responsibility, you know? Uh, it wasn't that we were well off, it wasn't. We were a middle income household, but you know, somebody made my food for me. Somebody took me to school. Somebody picked me up from school. It was very little thing. There was hardly anything that I would do for myself, you know? 
Mm -hmm. But come to the U.S. and all of a sudden, you know, I'm responsible for my money. I'm responsible for my time management. I have to get my studies done. It's a different country. There's no mom or dad there. I mean, it's it's a different, uh, you know, you move into survival mode. You know, that's why I said you're. I'm just going from day to day getting things done. I don't know that I realized that until now, right? Yes. So. I think when I look back and I and I and I think about some of the trauma I experienced, and I don't mean traumas and bad trauma, I just means, uh, you know, is the there trauma, good trauma? But, I mean, <laughs> trauma meaning no, there's no good trauma, but it's not trauma as in damaging me. Trauma more than uh, it's more like uh, I was probably scared, probably uh, you know the fear of the unknown. I think there was something there. Uh, that kept me moving in adrenaline mode, you know. Yes. Um, you know, how do you make ends meet? Okay, I have to find a job. Okay, let me get a job and uh, and make sure I pay rent. Oh yeah, there's rent. Oh, there's utilities too. And then and and it just it was just a cascade, a cascading lifestyle. You know, it wasn't that we splurged or anything, but it was just survival. You know. Yes. Mm -hmm. And. And you know, information is difficult to reach. You don't have you don't have anybody to turn to to get information. So, uh, so we really had to survive the the endeavor. When I look at my child now, you know, if he's stuck, he can pick up the phone and call me. If he yes. if he can't reach me, he can reach his uncles. Um, he can Google things. All this was not there when when we came to to the U.S. So. It's a different uh, set of circumstances, and and I really feel that it was um, is there the rite of passage. It kind of strengthened us to become tolerant and and uh, observant and uh, kind and uh, giving, and you know, and we put our best efforts. Uh, I think while there was no textbook that we went through, I think the processes that we went through taught us how to. How, how to stay in the good lane as opposed to the destructive lane because I have friends who went down the destructive lane and mm. that didn't end up well. Were they just struggling with being an immigrant and not having connection and so they got into other things that were destructive yeah. for them? Yeah. So while you're here and you're in college, what is your experience with African Americans? How are you relating, if at all? What is the conversation even in your head? So it was interesting. The school I attended was a very, it's the largest university in the US or back then it was. Um, I think with 90,000 students, there were 3,000 African Americans. So it was a very, Small David and Goliath kind of situation there. I think the decision I, I went in into the African American community and I realized that I didn't fit in. Uh, you know, there was I didn't understand the English they were speaking. There, it wasn't that they were speaking differently. It was just I just had a hard time following. You know what was going on, and I think that frustration led pushed me away from that group. But I did befriend some football players and some, um, and, and I think it might have been that a lot of the African American community members came from um, the Philly area and mm -hmm. they all knew each other. They were, um, uh, you know, th th their urban experience was very different than the, the experience I had. So I, 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 I really didn't fit in. Uh, but I tried. I tried uh, a couple of times because I have I had friends in other universities that were thriving, and I couldn't understand why I couldn't have the same relationship with the group that was available to me. Um, I think what ended up happening is I, I made friends at other campuses, at other universities, and they I'm still in touch with. So, okay. um, with other Ethiopians or African Americans, African -Americans or African Americans, African -Americans. 
Um, the Ethiopian community, we kind of stuck together, right? So I went to a very small school. Everybody is like a brother and a sister to me. You know, once we all landed here, we all, you know, found each other. And to this day, we're still together. I mean, uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's, that glue is, uh, is set. Nothing's going to change us. But um, as far as, you know, specific to the African co American community, the relationships I have today are very different than the relationships of my experience when I had in college. Now I have awesome friends that are, um, that get me, I get them, you know, we, we, we do things together, you know, just beautiful souls. But at that what point- What changed? What changed? What, what opened up that space to develop new relationships? Um, I think it's just, I, I think things, ha um, Coming down towards the DC area, I think the, the this urban area in in DC is different. I think from from the community that I um, that I was exposed to in Central Pennsylvania, um, I think times have changed. I think I think the melting pot has expanded. I think people's um, uh, perception of like you know when I came from Ethiopia, people would look at me and say I thought everybody you know, was was um, starving in Ethiopia or, you know, like they, they would make- Ah, I forgot about that whole, that there was that whole phase of just all of the imagery and yeah. yeah. So so was, uh, I think we, we got through that stigma phase, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and, and as the Ethiopian community ballooned in the DC area and people started experiencing more and more interactions with with um, you know the, the tips yeah, <laughs> the community it became a, I think the relationship started to strengthen and solidify and um, I, I can say definitely as I made my my uh, my uh, uh, move from Pennsylvania to Maryland from Maryland into Northern Virginia where I live now. Um, things have, uh, you know, and of course the sign of the times, everything has changed now. It's very different. It's very accommodating. I find more like-minded people. Um, yeah, maybe time, maybe it's yeah. time. <laughs> so when we spoke first, you taught, you had very interesting ideas around these three layers of identity. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to really talk about that, how you understand um, these layers. And I didn't know if it were if it was specific for an African um, in this culture or in general. So, oh goodness, <laughs> I, have to, I have to remember what I said to you. <laughs> I think um, we talk about ethnicity versus race versus culture. Maybe so, I can't remember. There was yeah. Okay, so you know when when. Um, Initially, when I, I I never look at my skin color, right? I I grew up as a human, you know. Nobody ever, you know. It's not a discussion that was ever at the table, you know, for for me. And I came to when I came to the U.S., um, I was in Ethiopia. That's it. I grew up there. That's my origin, and 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 um, it it never mattered for me, but. You know, in hindsight, as I look back to see, uh, you know, what, you know, when you go back and you try and look at your past, you want to understand, you want to do the math on what went wrong. Where did I misunderstand something? Why do I feel different today? And why did I not feel different in the past? What changed along the way um, is, a, is a question I tend to ask myself especially in the last 18 months, you know, uh, I've never ever felt um, that I was different, you know. Um, I, I can even give you an incident where I went to pick my, I sent my son to a small private school in, 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 in the area that I live. And um, when I went to pick him up, uh, you know, the first week of school, somebody asked me, whose child are you here to pick? And I didn't find that offensive <laughs> because yeah. my my reasoning was they just don't know any better, you know. 
I, I, I would attach an excuse to every um, inappropriate questioning. Let's leave it at that. Yeah, I, I didn't care. It didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. But in the last 18 months to two years, I have seen enough to wonder if my if it's right to not be aware of what's going on. So I try to do the math between, okay, you know, I have, we have to be proud of where we came from. So we're Ethiopian Americans. I call it, I, I don't like the word diaspora because it just, you know, doesn't mean anything to me, but we're, we're hyphenated Americans. So we're Ethiopian Americans, just like there's Italian American, there's Polish American, there's, Irish American, we're Ethiopian Americans. That's it. You know, that's how we uh, how we identify ourselves. And it's important that kids know their identity. And I think that's the angle that I was looking at. You know, I want my son to know that he's an Ethiopian American. He is. He should be a proud Ethiopian American. He should be a contributing member. He was born in the United States. He is. He has pledged allegiance uh, to the flag. Everything that comes with that package, we are Ethiopian Americans. But when it comes to our skin color and our, you know, I speak with an accent, it's amazing how quickly I can go from, from 10 to zero where I am nobody in no time when, when someone under, thinks that I'm from overseas. And I've experienced all sorts of nonsense, especially in the last two years. And I keep telling myself, do I fight back or do I, let it go. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm at that crossroad now where, you know, it's time to stand up and push back and say, no, it's enough, you know? And, and if we don't say that, who's going to say that? You know, that's, that's the challenge I face. And I don't remember what we talked about because I go no, off on no. tangents. But hopefully <laughs> it, I was, touched it on was very it. eloquent and beautiful. And this was <laughs> just as eloquent and beautiful, so that's fine. But I do think that there's this very interesting space that um, I understand because I've spent so much time on the continent that when you grow up, one in, in I say black space, but that isn't how someone would see it, right? They would see it as, their cultural space where they understand themselves. There isn't, it's a ho pretty homogeneous understanding of the world. They, the relationship to race is so dramatically different. And then to come to the United States and then be racialized. If you've never been racialized, you may reject that understanding of race. And I find, I always find it interesting when I talk to, um, especially Africans that are kind of in that, Old, where they've they've migrated maybe like 70s and 80s and or or the 90s and then now they're kind of experiencing this this kind of awakening do you feel like you're going through an awakening around race uh yes and and everywhere it's happening in ethiopia also where uh you know i grew up not knowing uh, or not paying not i shouldn't say not knowing but not paying attention to ethnic lines you know, the ethnicity is becoming an issue in Ethiopia now. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's racism here, that whether we like it or not, we gotta address the elephant in the room. Um, to answer your question, I don't know that I questioned it. I think I always knew it was there. I just didn't want to bother with it. You know, I didn't want to bring it into my space because I felt it was toxic. But now it's at a point where we have to say, look, you know, it's there. Uh, how do we, how do we reconcile? How do we, you know? And it's and I and we have to be careful because at the end of the day, somebody like me, I I came to the U.S. thirty years ago. There are people before me who came a different way to to the U.S. who have even worse wounds. You know, I don't have any wounds. I I am I'm fine. I I am getting inflict you know skin abrasion from time to time. But there are people who've given their life to uh, and and they're the ones. It's their fight. It's their story that 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 breaks me more than what I experience. What I'm experiencing is ignorance. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but. But the story is not, it, and we just get lumped under one umbrella 
But we have to carry the torch for everybody. Being quiet is not an option anymore. And and when you and I and what's really amazing to me is people that I thought were together and who understand us, the colors, the 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 vile, the 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 turning the face, their face another way, it's really opened my eyes on how uh, people view the situation and how very few stand up for, and I, and, I, and I adore some of my friends who have stood up and said enough alongside us. And yeah. there's a, a good number, but still there's a lot of work that needs to be done because I, to be honest, I had no idea that it was this bad. Mm. So I always think that um, when you're traveling, you don't have the the personal connection to the hist history, right? So if I went to Ethiopia, I could enjoy Ethiopia in a different way because I'm even in the midst of the chaos that's going on now with the ethnic issues that are going on on the ground. I don't have the historical hurt of those things, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can understand this idea of feeling like it's not really my fight, you know, mm -hmm. and you feel disconnected. But I think race becomes very interesting with the African community because you're brown. And when some a police goes to shoot somebody, they're not saying, are you Ethiopian? Yep. You know, like, are you Jamaican? You know, have you started to recognize, would it, when you think about blackness, have you began to recognize yourself as a black woman? Um, or is it still really tied to Ethiopia? And then there's a, just a consciousness around this idea that oh, ra the racism is increasing and, and it affects you. It's a, that's a very good question, actually, because it's, it's something that Ethiopians get accused of quite a bit, where we don't want to, want to live under the umbrella of being Black. I like the definition of black and brown. I think that that uh, that helps us come under one umbrella and 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 figure out how to use all our tools in order to fight this fight. Your in what way? When you say you like the definition of black and brown, what what do you mean? So When we look at, when we think of, uh, you know, we're, we want to, uh, when I look at Ethiopians, for instance, mm -hmm. the more north you go, the more lighter skin we become. And the more south we go, the more darker skin we, come, we become as a country. And there is a certain level of um, um, identity that we have to embrace, right? So I can say I am black, and I go to my son and I say, am I black? And he'll say, well, you're not black, you're brown, right? So we have to fit under a definition, right? We have to help kids come to the, to the, um, to the drawing board, so to speak, so that we can all fight the fight together. And, you know, it's the same thing with Asians. If you say Asian American versus, you know, if, when you, when, if you've traveled in Asia, if you, if you call, a Chinese person, a Japanese, and a Japanese person, a Singaporean, they get offended very quickly. You know, mm -hmm. they're not all lumped under the same umbrella. Mm -hmm. And I think taking away that, that one big umbrella and saying, look, we're all in this together. We all need to fit under this umbrella. And we need to focus our fight on this one fight of racism. I think it brings us under one umbrella so that we can get it done. Because I can so tell you- is it, me, a, is it like an inability? Is it the desire to not have the relationship to blackness? So, so to, to be clear, I think of blackness as a political identity. It's not a skin color issue. Um, so I think that's a fuzzy line for us, for me, at least. For me, it's a fuzzy line. I take the literal translation and and I think a lot of the children beneath us, they also take, I always look at it from the youth perspective, you know, because, you know, when I made that click in my mind, uh, when the African-American community or the black American community would not accept me, I felt that I wasn't black enough. 
You know? When you say they didn't accept you, in what ways? Like, and um, specifically? I, I just didn't fit in there. I didn't. I wasn't like them. I didn't speak like them. I didn't have the same cultural sensitivities. I didn't um, understand, um, you know, the, the sentences they were constructing. I don't know how, how to explain did they to make, did they like? Did they make you feel bad about yourself? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, not being accepted makes you feel bad at the end of the way. It makes you wonder why you don't fit, right? It makes you question why you don't fit. Mm. And, I, and I'm hearing it. I just want to make sure, because this is the time I feel like to work out some of these ideas. Um, mm -hmm. Because I've heard it say before, like, because it's one thing, right, to not feel connected or like you fit, right? Mm -hmm. It's another thing to for someone to say, I'm not accepted. So was there a space? And, and I've seen it happen. So it could absolutely be that. But was there something specifically that African-Americans were doing to you to make you feel like you didn't belong there? Were they excluding you from conversations because of your accent? Were they... Because sometimes I wonder where when this starts, like what are what are the little igniting things that happen? So now I'm I'm kind of going from memory from 30 years ago. Yeah. So you have to you have to pardon me. I I I always try so my some of the uh, uh, stories I'm sharing with you I am paralleling it to the 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 20 somethings that are around me and what they experience right so when they go to um a formal or when they go to uh an event and they get they are included i kind of parallel it back to my experience and wonder why i wasn't included you know um I remember, for instance, um, I was invited to join a sorority. Mm. And, and I didn't even make it past the first whatever, the meet and greet. I mean, the girls said, no, nope, she's not part of us. Mm. OK? And I did this because somebody told me it's the best place to make friends. Mm. OK? But if I, I went to a, a different group and that group accepted me. So I was like, okay, what did I do wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you start focusing on yourself. And at that point I said, okay, you know what? The black American community, and back then nobody called the, there wasn't an African American community. Oh, yeah. It was a black Absolutely. American community. And, and I think that might be the reason why I like the idea of black and brown because I think it, it takes care of all of us because uh, back then I wouldn't be accepted as a black American, but because I didn't have the right, you know, boxes checked off. Maybe that's the reason why. I don't know. You know, I don't know mm -hmm. that I've thought about it, but, but. Um, I would love to get some memoirs, like to think about that more deeply and have you one day come back or, cause I, I do think that sometimes these disconnections that we feel aren't always necessarily true. Sometimes they are absolutely true. I know when I've been on the continent and I felt excluded, mm -hmm. I realized that I was not, I didn't understand language. And language is something so specific, especially on the continent, that I mean, even if you're even if you're Ghanaian and you're Twi and someone else is Ashanti, like just because of the language differences, they might be they might have these separations, you know? And when I started to kind of understand the nuances of those cultures, I realized I wasn't necessarily being excluded, but I didn't understand. And because yeah. I didn't understand, like I, and I, and then there are times where I think that people were being blatantly disrespectful and rude and, and not accepting me for whatever they thought African-Americans were based on television and their perceptions. But I do find it curious, like when those initial moments ignite where we start to disconnect, and those, I think, are the spaces where I feel like we need to go back and either figure out how to heal those and make sure that our children don't perpetuate those same things, you know, and that's exposure, you know, or experience those things. You know, I would, I would love to see my daughter be in a world where 
a young African girl would seem the same to her as her. Yeah. I have to tell you that my my college experience, my educational college experience was above my expectations. As I told you, I don't know. I didn't know enough, you know. I think I wasn't exposed to enough. I was I didn't start off in an urban area. I started off in a rural area. So so and I come from a capital city. So I I went from being in a capital city that was and then I and straight into you know the country <laughs> exactly so i don't know if that had something to do with it because i you know again i'm very good at compartmentalizing and blocking information so if i don't want to think about it i just put it in a little box and throw it back into my memory bank and that's it you know <laughs> um because that's my survival skills it's not yeah. uh, but yeah. i i can flip this conversation and tell you look you know, i've traveled to most of the Anglophone countries in Africa. And there were countries where I was like, oh my gosh, I can live here. And then there were countries where I was like, there's absolutely no way in hell that I'll stay in these countries. Not because I didn't want to, but I didn't feel like I belonged. Yes. You know? and, and that the belonging is interesting. That's why I think this idea of blackness, it creates some sense of unity because there is a shared experience. There's not one African nation I've ever been to that doesn't have a shared experience of colonialism, of racism, of, of whatever it is. They might not recognize it that way, mm -hmm. which I find interesting. And Ethiopia is especially interesting to me. And I wanna talk about this because I lived in Italy. Mm -hmm. And so when I lived in Italy, I lived amongst a lot of Ethiopians, as you know. You know. And um, I always loved the story of Ethiopia pretty much kicking the Italians behind and like kicking them out. And like, you know, it was such a, a source of pride for me. And I wasn't even Ethiopian. I always loved that story about it. And I always found um, these relationships very interesting. And then when I studied in Russia, all of the Russian priests would be sent to Ethiopia to study. And I, I at 16 saw, you know, Mary and Jesus painted as black, you know, because they were taking Orthodox Ethiopian Christianity in the mm. Russian context. And so I wonder, like, as an Ethiopian, being the one nation that was never colonized, mm. do you think that that had some, some um, space within how you understood yourself? Not really. No. Mm -mm. no. I mean, for me, it's... Uh, uh, you know, it's it's a national pride thing. Yes, um, I we didn't grow up talking about that. You know, because we lived under a socialist regime, and uh, you know, again, it was another, you know, 60, 14, 15 years of survival mode. You know, for my parents at least. You know, they all their effort was just to get us educated and to make sure things didn't get worse. You know, and the first opportunity they had. You know, after we finished school, was to uh, to um, give us the opportunity to learn something overseas. You know, to get better education. Uh, I know when I left Ethiopia, the the understanding was that I would come back. Uh, I would go back to to uh, work there and to to have a, a, a to to live in Ethiopia. Uh, didn't work out that way, clearly. <laughs> so. Um, but you know, uh, you know, for me, part of me is on the continent. You know, I, I, uh, while I love America and I love everything that's around me, and you know, uh, I'm, I'm very dedicated and and understanding of the privileges that I have uh, in these United States. Um, I'm still, um, I still feel that Africa needs us. You know, we are the only brand ambassadors for the continent that truly understand what the continent needs um, and how to how to um, help them not be preyed on. Because that's what I feel that they're going through at the moment is that I feel like the whole continent, like everybody's looking at it with a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, but as far as as the the whole um, colonizing colonization, and I'm not very deep in the history aspect, but mm -hmm. I can tell you that unless Africans respect Africans 
and we we start divorcing the idea that the answers all lie uh, from the donor countries, our continent is going to continue to suffer. And for me, that's kind of the mission I picked up uh, two years ago, and uh, I'm trying to do that work. Um, Let's talk time. about it. What are you doing? What are you doing? Tell me all about it. So um, I think I think the the tipping point for me was um, I read an article that was uh, produced out of South Africa. I think the company, the organization sits in South Africa and uh, there was a list produced and the list said, the list's title was 100 popular brands of Africa. I think was the, was the name of the list. And on there, there were only four African brands. Everything else was Coca-Cola, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, they were all American, European brands. And I'm like, how on earth is this continent ever getting going to, to win this war on branding? And it was an organization that was donor funded, African, uh, you know, African run, their objective was to promote the continent, and they were here. They are promoting the same product products. So I, I, I had a you know a aha moment, and I said, okay, you know what? We, let's let's try and see what we can do around branding. And so uh, from there, we um, I started a, a, an entity called Media for Africa, where uh, we focused on just curating positive stories uh, off the continent um, and, and started pushing this out. We have about 300,000 followers um, uh, who receive our, uh, our posts of, uh, when we post these, these articles. We don't write the articles, other people write it, but we kind of aggregate it so people can read the pos positive articles through our website. From there, I started uh, helping, uh, um, Af uh, you know, people. I'd say Africans, um, people on the continent, people in other places that want to work with the continent, uh, try um, who want who needed a digital strategy or a strategy in order to uh, work uh, with this community, um, and we started with four pro bono clients that uh, we uh, did, did, did their social media strategy for. I think we're now servicing about 45 clients. Wow. Um, and uh, and growing. Um, uh, we um, I am and 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 I do a few things. So I'll 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 just um, uh, uh, focus on on the Media Africa uh, project. Um, so every month or every other month, we take on one or two pro bono clients and kind of help them through the process. Um, I don't engage with anybody uh, without knowing what they need first. So we try to understand the client, their needs. Uh, we'll spend time with them. We'll see if our values align. Um, because um, a business relationship is just a business relationship. I would prefer to have a meaningful relationship where I can see a company grow and achieve their goals. Uh, so we do anything from website design to... Um, to as I said, social media strategies, uh, lead generation uh, strategies. Um, in some cases, you know, I rewrite their business plans for them. I re I help them pivot. I'll give them advice whether they like it or not. But, uh, <laughs> but we, I try to really give them everything they need in order to be successful. Now it takes two to tango, so the other side has to be willing to to have the dialogue. Um, and I can't say that everybody was a, it was a slam dunk, but you know, progress happens. Um, some very fast, some very slow, but, uh, and then eventually I think, I think my, my goal is to, you know, I saw a lot of talent on the ground in Africa as I was traveling and a lot of them do not, you know, outside of their their cocoon, they don't they don't realize that there's a huge world outside that wants to support them. And uh, you know, if we can figure out the logistics, you know, I would rather buy directly from the continent. You know, if I want a leather bag, or if I want a Christmas gift, or if I want a you know a, a pair of sandals, you know, I'd rather give them the money than uh, you know. Uh, 
Michael Kors or mm -hmm. Prada or any of these guys, I mean, I'd rather send it there because I know it'll have a direct impact. Uh, we just have to figure out the logistics, you know, how to get the product from where it is to, to, um, to, to where we are. Uh, so that's where I spend most of my time. I ha I am in love. I love what I do. Um, time is means nothing to me anymore. Now I I, I will uh, plow in as much time as needed to to help. Um, and yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm happy. <laughs> so I would normally end this by asking. Um, what is blackness to you? But I don't think we're there yet. I think we're still working towards blackness. With yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I do want to ask you this. When you think about the things that are plaguing Africa, what are the parallels that you see for the things plaguing the African-American community? Do you see the intersections of our experiences? Uh Yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense of parallels of experiences. We're afraid of growth. I, I've noticed, you know, both here in the U.S., uh, the African American community that I I I see. In fact, I was on a. I'm a member of the of the Black Chamber in in Northern Virginia, and I listen to entrepreneurs speak there, and. You know, one uh, one of the uh, directors the other day uh, said, and I didn't realize this, that you know, a, a, a big portion, and I, I want to say he said ninety percent or you know eighty percent, but a big portion of the African American uh, businesses are sole proprietors. Uh, they don't; they are one man or two man operation. And growing is a challenge, and and I don't know why. I mean, I I'm going to clearly look into this. Is something that I came across very recently, and that's the same challenge I see on the continent. Is I see a lot of small operations that are unable to expand. I mean, we're trying through government programs and and um, uh, you know donor programs to get these small operations to become bigger and on the continent. But right here in my neck of the woods, we have the same problem. Mm -hmm. So so how how we resolve those kind of issues, I don't know. I mean you need really strong leadership. You need uh, you need the government to be part of the uh, you know the, you need the government to be a stakeholder. You need many stakeholders in order to get through the this hard this Herculean effort is it's almost. Uh, do, you, like, do you feel like um, you know enough about the historical context of the continent, how we got there, you know, from that angle and from the US? Is there enough historical education and to understand the institutions that exist that prevent growth? Or do you think it's just a mindset? I think it's a mindset. I think it's a mindset because I'm a good example, right? Uh, uh, I refused to to conform and I've blown through, like I'm not your typical uh, African-American person, right? I had the same set of rules. I, you know, started with one college degree. I forced my way through. I kept pivoting until I found what I wanted. Um, and I and I don't know that I am the exception to the rule. I think there are a lot of people like me um, out there. I think in 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 business though, in entrepreneurship, there is a disconnect, especially in the U.S. I think, and and we can have this conversation again. As I as I said, I've I've recently embraced to understand what what's going on. Um, I do. I do think there's a level of um, uh, there's an access issue and there is a, a lack of information issue. You know, uh, there there are programs for minorities, but are they in reach? I'm actually going through this process to understand it because I want to see 
Go oh, ahead. we're going to bring you back, Sustina, because yeah. you're going to get all this new information and then we're going to have a whole new conversation yeah. <laughs> around. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm curious. So what would you say is the typical African-American? You aren't one. And so what is one? Oh, I mean, I don't mean it in a, in a, in a No, no, in a, I'm not offended. These are the <laughs> things we have to talk about, right? Like the, these are the, the ideas that I think we have to deconstruct. So I'm fascinated by it. I'm not offended by any of it. No, what I, mean, what I meant, I'm not your typical African-American. I didn't mean it in, in a way where, um, uh, I meant it in such a way that I drive more. I, I drive to get what I want because I was trained by other you know, people who drive and get what they want. You know, mm -hmm. someone recently said to me, you know, why is there a fear for, for, so I don't know if you know the statistic, the, the number of African-Americans who actually applied for an SBA loan mm -hmm. was 10%, 15%, a very small number compared to our Caucasian uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, counterparts. Mm -hmm. So the Caucasian side, there was something like a 90% participation rate, whereas on the African-American side, there's a 10%. So that clearly tells us they're afraid of loans. Or, or they think that they don't have the credit. Or they, have, to, they, they think they don't have the credit to be able to qualify. Correct. And even though they've said up to $25,000, all you have to have is a heartbeat. <laughs> right? So, right. I said, okay, let me go through the process myself rather than me, you know, wondering, let me try. And I, a friend of mine and I, both the same size business, we both started the process together. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not going to tell you what happened. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to. You want to uh, call attention to all that money you got. <laughs> yeah, not a lot, trust me. <laughs> but, <laughs> this is just a let's test it and see what happens kind of thing. And it was it was interesting that the vetting process is different, the 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 checks and balances are different. I mean, she and I are exactly the same thing. The only thing that differentiates us is our appearance. <laughs> so that's where I am gonna end this because I think that this will be a continuum. We're gonna come back. I, I find like I'm excited about consciousness. I think anytime people start to see what's happening around them is an exciting time because once you get into consciousness everything can shift and that's where real change can happen and you know you start to understand yourself differently and the things around you differently so i'm so curious what your journey is going to be like a year from now especially because i'm sure you're a researcher and you're going to start researching all of the things that exist but i just have loved this conversation thank you very much I Thank appreciate you. you. Yeah, I, I mean, I want to point out if you guys um, are still watching and people that watch it on um, after you know we're finished with live, the media. Tell me, media for Africa. At, yeah, media for the number four and then Africa. So media for yeah. Africa. It's such a. Um, I'm I'm so excited about this because there are so. I always tell people there are so there's so much negative about the continent of Africa, that if you never, ever, ever said another bad word, you still couldn't make the playing field better, right? Like it couldn't, it would never be equal. Um, and I find it challenging because in order for us to grow, I believe myself an African, which I'm sure we'll have plenty of conversations around that too. But as we grow as African people, you know, um, we have to be critical. We have to be thoughtful. We have to push each other. We have to ask each other better questions. And that takes not always talking about the nice things, right? But I'm always challenged with it because I know I'm in the world and I'm often showing people Africa for the first time. You know, I'm showing it through my pictures and I make a, a I don't go to slums. I go to the best places. I go to the best restaurants. I show the best houses. And I do it because you've seen that. I don't have to show you that. There's a thousand pictures of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm so I'm excited about the work that you do and I think it's necessary. And if you guys can check it out, Media for Africa, make sure you do that. Um, so thank you for that work. I, I, it's absolutely necessary. Um, but we're gonna keep challenging each other and figuring yes. it out. <laughs> yes. 
So thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. And uh, if there's anything I could do to help uh, grow your organization, let me know. I'll be happy. Absolutely. I'm going to call you. Don't worry. I need all the strategies I can get. <laughs> all, right. all right. Sounds so, good. Thank you for watching Working Towards Black. Um, today was fascinating. And um, join the global movement if you have not done so on Facebook. It will keep you up to date on all of my shenanigans and all of the things that I'm doing um, across the continent and over the world. Um, uh, we have some really great projects coming up. Um, I'm doing a Black Freedom Colony in Mexico um, for people that just want to escape this election season and be in some Black space and peace. Um, so those things are listed there if you're interested in bringing yourself or your family. Uh, there is Free Black Women Magazine has launched, freeblackwomenmagazine.com. And we're always looking for writers. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> and I want, we have writers from all over, Black women and men from Africa, from the Caribbean, from the US, now from the UK. So we're growing and expanding. Um, so if you're interested in writing, um, it's a little love effort, but if you're interested in participating, we really would love to have you. So thank you guys. And I'll see you next Tuesday. I'm working towards Black. And thank you, Cecilia. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Uh, thank Bye -bye. you. Don't go anywhere.